Well, welcome to another Megcram lecture. We're going to talk about heart failure today. Now, sometimes this can be a little confusing because there's a lot of different definitions. This was known as congestive heart failure, and there's been some new definitions that have been introduced that have been a little bit confusing as well. And we're going to go over the basics first here in the first lecture and tell you a little bit about the definitions and also the pathophysiology behind heart failure. Now, generally speaking, if you look at the heart, and we will symbolize that here with an actual heart, remember the heart is just a pump, and you've got blood going into it. And by definition, all blood that goes to the heart must go to the heart via veins, and then you have blood coming out of the heart. And by definition, those are arteries. Now, of course, in the pulmonic circulation, the arteries have deoxygenated blood and the vein has oxygenated blood. And in the systemic circulation, all of the arteries have oxygenated blood and all of the veins have deoxygenated blood. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But as you can see, the heart is meant to pump blood and have it flowing in the correct direction. Generally speaking, if you have heart failure, you're not going to get as much blood going forward and you're not going to get as much blood going in. And so as a result, the two major types of symptoms that you're going to see in heart failure is not enough forward flow. And because there's not enough forward flow, blood stays in the heart. And as a result of that, blood which should be entering the heart is not entering the heart. And as a result of that, you're going to see congestion before it. Okay, this is like an accident on the freeway. There is no traffic in front of the accident because there's not enough forward flow. But we certainly know that there's plenty of traffic before the accident and there's quite a bit of congestion. Now, things would be pretty simple in this situation if this is all that we had. And so we're going to get into a little bit more detail, but let's look at how these symptoms manifest themselves. Not enough forward flow could mean, number one, kidney function decreases. Just think about all of the organs, which are all of them, that rely on blood perfusion. And if the kidneys are not getting enough blood, you're going to have kidney function decreasing. That, of course, is going to activate the renoangiotensin system or the RAS system. It will also activate the antidiuretic hormone system. Of course, this is going to increase the amount of fluid retention that you have, and that could exacerbate your congestive heart failure. Number two, think about your pulmonary system. and think of chain stokes respirations, okay? So not enough carbon dioxide is circulating and therefore you get chain stokes ventilation where you breathe fast and then you breathe slow. A lot of the symptoms that you see are on the congestion side. And so certainly when you have congestion, the first organ that it goes to is the lung. So think of pulmonary edema. But if it keeps backing up, you know that the next organ it's going to go to is the liver. So liver congestion. So you could see the AST and the ALT go up. This is also known as nutmeg liver. Because if you do a cross-sectional of the liver, it would look like there is nutmeg. You would also get elevated pulmonary artery pressures. and also think of pedal edema. So these constellation of symptoms can be divided in problems associated with poor output and problems associated with poor input or congestion. And in any heart failure, you could see both of these types of symptoms. Now, I wanna talk about the heart itself. Now the heart we said is a pump. But it's not your typical swimming pool pump, which you just turn on and it just runs continuously. It actually has two very distinct actions. It has an action 
of active contraction, and it also has an action of active relaxation. And it's this active relaxation that is the most misunderstood. And so there are two phases of this pump, if you will, a two-stroke pump, where there is one phase called systole, and there is another phase called diastole. Now, systole is where there is active contraction. Diastole is when there is active relaxation. If you have a problem with either of these two functions, you could get congestive heart failure. Systole is when the heart is pumping blood actively into the aorta and to the systemic circulation and pulmonic circulation. When it relaxes, however, blood enters from the veins into the heart, both the pulmonic vein and also the inferior vena cava, and allows the heart to fill. If the heart can't contract, you have something called systolic dysfunction. If the heart can't relax, you have something called diastolic dysfunction. There is something that is known as the ejection fraction, otherwise known as the E. F. The ejection fraction is simply the size of the heart at end diastole in other words the size of the heart when it's the largest minus the size of the heart at end systole in other words, the size of the heart after it contracts. So in other words, what we're looking at here is how much blood was pumped out of the heart. And we divide it by the size of the heart at the end of diastole. So what we're saying here is that the ejection fraction is the proportion of blood that the heart can pump out in one contraction. The thing I want you to notice is that if the heart has a hard time contracting, this number up here is going to get smaller. But this number is going to stay the same. Let's review that again. If there's a problem with systole, if the heart is too weak to contract, then these numbers are going to be very similar. And therefore, the difference between them is going to be very low this number will not change, however, and so the ejection fraction will go down in systolic dysfunction. However, in diastolic dysfunction, remember what the problem is. The problem is, is that the heart can't relax, and as a result of the heart not being able to relax, this number will go down. And as a result, when you have a small heart that can't relax, there's not a lot of blood that you can pump out of a small heart. And so therefore, what happens in this situation is this will stay about the same. Or if it goes down, this also goes down. And so as a result, the ejection fraction in diastolic dysfunction is about the same. It doesn't change. And this distinction has been made with the new classification. Let's talk about that. Officially speaking, this is the new terminology. There's something called heart failure due to reduced ejection fraction. And then there is heart failure with normal ejection fraction. Now, if you notice, Here is the reduced, here is the normal. That's all you really need to look at. You know that if you have a reduced ejection fraction, then you have systolic dysfunction. And the problem here is that blood cannot be ejected out of the heart. Blood can't get 
out. As a result of the fact that blood can't get out, then blood can't get in to the heart. Okay? Now, with a normal ejection fraction, what's the problem here? The problem is, is that blood can't get into the heart because the muscles won't relax. When the muscles don't relax, they can't relax enough to allow the blood to come into the heart during diastole. And so here the problem is, is the blood can't get in. And as a result of the fact that the blood can't get into the heart, the blood can't come out of the heart. The heart can't pump that blood out if it's not getting in. Blood can't get out. Notice you have the same problems in both types of heart failure, but the key is, is the why. The reason why you have heart failure due to a normal ejection fraction is because blood can't get in. The reason why you have heart failure in a reduced ejection fraction is because blood can't get out. Now, what are some of the causes of these things? Let's talk about reduced ejection fraction. So things that can cause reduced ejection fraction would be ischemic heart disease. So you haven't had enough oxygen going to the heart, and as a result of that, tissue has died, and it's no longer functional. It's weak. If parts of the whole muscle die, you can even have aneurysms of the heart muscle. So ischemic heart disease is classic. Think of this in coronary artery disease, people that have had cabbage, people with diabetes, okay? So what's the problem in normal ejection fraction? Well, remember here is that blood can't get into the heart. And the reason why blood can't get into the heart is because they've had hypertension for so long that their muscles are so thick that they can't relax anymore. So the big one here is hypertension almost certainly. So think of these in patients with a normal ejection fraction, and they've got thickened myocardium, left ventricular hypertrophy. These people still benefit from Lasix, because remember, blood can't get in, therefore blood can't get out. And if blood can't get in, it's going to congest into the pulmonary circulation. So the key that I want you to remember here is if you suspect somebody has congestive heart failure, and you get an echocardiogram and the ejection fraction is greater than 40%, you really can't say that this patient doesn't have congestive heart failure because they very well certainly can. They would have heart failure with a normal ejection fraction. We'll talk later about some of the other aspects of heart failure. Please join us for our next video. Thanks for joining us.